Hello, everybody. It's Jacek Bartosiak, Strategy and Future. Today with me is Nikolas Gwozdev, uh, uh, that uh, I met uh, per, uh, our guest. I met him first time six years ago uh, in the United States in a very special place. But because he has been involved in so many institutions and places where he also teaches, so uh, we agreed uh, prior to recording that uh, Nicolas will introduce himself so that everything is uh, properly addressed. Nicolas. Sure. So very happy to be joining you uh, in my capacity as a senior fellow for Eurasia at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and editor of its journal, Orbis. Okay. Uh, so, th so this is uh, this is what we have already. So, my first question is, Nicholas. So, is Eurasia in flames? Is the um, the ar security architecture and uh, the balance of power already completely destroyed, and something new will have to emerge? And the emergence of it and the process towards emerging of the new new more or less stable uh, system will be bloody chaotic, as it has always been throughout the history of, of mankind when the systemic wars uh, erupt. What is your take on it? Well, I agree with you that we are seeing a change. So not to uh, put too big a, a point on it, but to use the German phrase, uh, Zeitungwende, uh, the end of an age, the change of the age, we are in, we're in, in such a period. Uh, the world that emerged after 1989 to 1991 in Eurasia, the expectations that we had uh, in the West uh, about uh, certainly uh, a cooperative relationship with Russia, if not full Russian integration into Western institutions, as was very optimistically predicted in the early 1990s, uh, when uh, then Secretary of State Warren Christopher uh, received a memorandum about uh, how Russia could be a member of NATO by 2005, uh, even if it wasn't that optimistic, a sense that uh, Russia was moving in a cooperative direction with the West. This would okay. enable, uh, if uh, a cooperative relationship from, as Clinton and Yeltsin discuss, uh, discussed in Vancouver, uh, in 1993, that from Vancouver to Vladivostok, uh, moving east uh, across North America, Europe, and then the Eurasian Plain, we could end up with some degree of a, a security community. Uh, the European Union's initial proposals for a wider neighborhood with Russia uh, to have these partnerships, these spaces, as they were discussed in the early 2000s, uh, again, predicated on the idea that we could have a cooperative relationship uh, with Moscow, uh, that uh, Russia's goals would align with those of the West for creating uh, a stable security architecture and also, to be frank, a, a stable economic architecture. Uh, the idea of, of creating a greater integrated economic space between North America, the European Union, and then the peripheries of Europe into Eurasia. Uh, when it became clear, uh, particularly in the second term of the Putin administration by uh, the mid-2000s, that this was not the direction uh, that things were moving in, uh, then the discussion shifted towards, well, could we find some sort of, of workable modus vivendi between uh, Russia and the West in terms of a Eurasian uh, understanding? Uh, the talk about whether this would mean NATO enlargement, pausing, could countries on Russia's border still pursue partnership agreements with the European Union? Could we find some mechanism for uh, coordinating that? 2008, 2014 uh, gave us answers there. Uh, what we now have in the wake of Russia's second invasion of Ukraine in 2022 uh, is a move towards rupturing all of these uh, ideas and connectivities. Uh, in the 1990s, the sense that uh, both with Russia and with China, that greater trade, greater integration would pull Russia and China into 
uh, a Western-led liberal order would incentivize them. Uh, we're now moving through a period of decoupling. Uh, it may not be complete decoupling, but certainly a partial decoupling, partial deglobalization in terms of those links. Uh, the link, the economic linkages between Russia and Europe and Russia and the United States are, are uh, breaking apart, uh, either because of our sanctions or because of the Russian counter sanctions. Uh, and so instead of thinking of integration uh, and what, on whatever terms, we're now seeing the beginnings uh, of a fracturing. Uh, and this is a violent fracturing, as you've noted. It's not a peaceful fracturing. Uh, it is violent. Uh, and it is beginning to determine uh, which parts, uh, when that fracturing begins, obviously countries are going to be worried about when the fracture points, when the shatter points begin to develop on what side of the fracture they're going to end up on. Um, the fracture, of course, runs directly through uh, the territory of Ukraine right now in, in the context of a military conflict, uh, but definitely as we've seen in recent months, concerns in uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, about uh, as Russia sort of cracks away from the West, uh, where does this leave uh, countries on Russia's borders? Can you uh, maneuver, uh, act as a bridge? Can you act as a connectivity, as we've seen to some extent, Azerbaijan and Turkey trying to do, uh, of saying, look, we know that this crack is coming, but we're going to try to continue to maintain ties and bridges, uh, or are the cracks going to become unbridgeable? Uh, then that leads to a larger question about the Eurasian space, if we think of it in a, in a larger context, not just simply Russia, not just simply the former Soviet Union, but we think of Eurasia uh, really starting from the Arctic Circle through Central Europe, the Balkans, uh, the Northern Middle East, and then all the way on the Great Plains and steps uh, to China, uh, and the Far East. Uh, what's going to happen uh, if this, as you said, becomes a zone of contestation? Uh, and then that opens up the question of the role of China, the role of India, uh, the role of the United States, as the United States is reevaluating the centrality of Eurasia to its own foreign policy uh, for pretty much a uh, th hundred years since the First World War, uh, Eurasia has been uh, key to American geo strategy. Now, increasingly, we are uh, seeing the United States grappling with what it means to pivot to the Indo-Pacific Basin. Uh, in which case, uh, does Eurasia and even Europe uh, become less uh, not of importance necessarily, but less of a priority or less of, of where the United States can? can play attention. So this Russian fracturing of Eurasia is taking place in the context also of the U.S. pivot away from a hundred years uh, where the transatlantic relationship was the priority, where ensuring a balance on the greater Eurasian space was a priority, uh, containing the Soviet Union, uh, and then uh, trying to uh, develop a post-Cold War settlement that would endure uh, in that space, uh, and now as the United States is, is torn between going back and continuing with that or pivoting to the, to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this obviously kind of creates uh, ground for a, a, a much further discussion, but one last point before I, before I pause on this, which is important, which is that uh, Russia's, uh, Russia is again facing its own uh, historical choices about where it will go in terms of seeking partners uh, and allies. And it foreclosed on a relationship with the United States in terms of a partnership. Uh, increasingly, because of what it has done in Ukraine, uh, it has foreclosed uh, the possibility of building with France and Germany, at least as the Russians perceived it, a kind of uh, encouraging a European strategic autonomy that would distance itself from the United States and would be closer uh, to Russia. I think that that is now effectively over. Uh, and now Russia faces the possibility, and, and it may be a very unpleasant one, of negotiating its relationship with China uh, in a much more transactional fashion, uh, which may preserve certain Russian equities, but at a much higher cost 
uh, partnership with China will potentially bring a much higher cost uh, to Russia, uh, but it also raises questions for uh, Europe uh, and the United States of what it means to have Russia and China uh, in a closer embrace uh, with China as potentially the dominant partner uh, in that partnership uh, for the first time really since, uh, since uh, perhaps one could argue since the, the days of the Mongols when uh, Beijing uh, controlled the destiny of uh, uh, the Eurasian space. Uh, and what, again, it means for that question of fracturing um, in terms of the countries along Russia's southern and western borders, uh, if Russia is pulled uh, or grudgingly moves closer to China, uh, that also potentially sets up a very different global map uh, than the ones we've been thinking about, uh, certainly for the last 30 years. Yeah, let, let's uh, uh, permit me to split your you know brief introduction into a more into a more granular uh, elements and ask you of course the questions about those granular elements. Let's start with of course the uh, the primary global power, the United States. You mentioned the uh, since the First World War, Eurasia's center of attention of the United States geostrategic attention is obvious. Balancing Eurasia, you know, we know both edges of Eurasia, actually two world wars and the Cold War, just to, to make sure that, uh, you know, Americans are preventing the regional hegemony. Uh, this I understand. But how you think the current United States strategy look in a granular fashion? towards Eurasia, given the fact that the world has become of more of connectivity, got closer to each other, as Robert Kaplan rightly stated to the, in his report to the Office of Net Assessment like uh, three or four years ago about the Marco Polo world, and uh, that the United States has to balance both edges at the same time. And one could argue also the third edge, Persian Gulf, where strategic flows you know, also culminate. So. Too many fronts, too, as always, too few resources, and the confrontation between the Spike Man's vision of controlling the Rimland and the world ocean just to, to, to create proper balance of power, or Mackinder's vision of being an active player, for example, in the Intermarium region, so that the continental powers of Europe and Russia, in this case also China, could not start cooperating and create trade patterns that will undermine the Anglosphere. So what is the current, because this is exactly the dilemma that the Ukraine, one Ukraine is closed to the American craftsmen, strategy craftsmen, and what is the strategy and what should be the strategy in your opinion to address those things? Yeah. Well, I think right now what you're seeing in Washington, if I may, may speak frankly, is a bit of strategic incoherence uh, in that uh, the fact that the Biden administration was prepared to release its national security strategy uh, in the spring and the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, forced uh, edits that, that had to go back in to be redrafted suggested that uh, the Russian invasion uh, was if not unexpected, since the Biden administration had been warning about it uh, since the fall, that it was a possibility, but that it had not been considered perhaps as such the game changer uh, as it's now proving to be. Uh, and so I think, uh, as you said, even if you have policymakers in Washington who, who don't recognize uh, the names Spickman and Mackinder, you're, you are seeing um, really uh, in the different factions if I may call them factions or schools or camps within the Biden administration on foreign policy, uh, really arguing out what you've just laid out. Uh, where should be the focus uh, with limited resources and attention? Uh, where should we go? Uh, there has been uh, essentially an effort uh, right now, if we can sort of see what has been emerging by default, which is focus a lot now on Ukraine try to negotiate in the Persian Gulf and in the Middle East some sort of workable settlement uh, 
the president uh, in going to the Middle East, uh, most people focused on the question of energy, uh, but really part of that visit was to, to try to shore up uh, and continue this uh, realignment among uh, the Abrahamic Accord countries, and then, of course, uh, to try to re, uh, re-engage Iran with the nuclear deal as a way of let's kind of tap down the Persian Gulf area, the, the Middle East, so that we aren't focused there. And then the hope that we can kind of delay or postpone some of what we need to do in the India-Pacific basin by focusing first on Ukraine. So right now we have by default a Ukraine first strategy, um, which is to focus our attention uh, on stemming and pushing back the Russian invasion, shoring up uh, European alliances, re-pushing back or redeploying back into Europe uh, with the hope that we can fix this and then pivot back to the Indo-Pacific. Some of the debates that you've seen in Washington Uh, and in the United States strategic community are whether or not this is feasible. Uh, The idea that uh, as you continue to delay certain elements of your Asia strategy, it becomes harder uh, to build the infrastructure. At what point do you uh, say Europe has had enough? I think one of the things we've seen with the Biden administration I'll, I'll go back and restart that. that yeah, that yeah. Line. Sorry, sorry um, for that. Internet. One of the things Not that the, the Biden, yeah, no, no, no problem. It's easy enough to fix in the editing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things that the Biden administration had hoped was that the economic sanctions plus the military assistance that's already been given to Ukraine would have been enough uh, to induce a change in Russian behavior. Uh, the, the problem, the crux of the problem we have now is Russia's resilience uh, perhaps is greater than we expected or we planned for. Uh, and so now we're faced with, as you said, a strategic choice. Do you continue to invest uh, time and resources uh, in the question of Ukraine if this begins to detract from other parts of the world? And you've seen some of the Asianists in the United States. States very concerned about, for example, the drawdown of weapons stockpiles. So this is a shorter term question, but again, this longer term question, which is, uh, and, and which first of all has implications for Ukraine, which is, is the end result in Ukraine that the United States is willing to live with, not what we would like to see, which is a, a different question, but from a strategic point of view, uh, one where essentially uh, we hold the line you sufficiently so that Russian ability to project power and force into the rest of Europe is blunted, and then we essentially wait for uh, the impact of decoupling Russia from the West to to work on the Russian economy, Uh, in essence, uh, perhaps conceding that Ukraine would be a frozen conflict in order to focus on Asia uh, sooner, or as the debate is occurring in Washington, is it, no, we have to get Ukraine right now. We have to fix the situation. We have to completely push the Russians back in a way, in in a way to also demonstrate to China that we would not tolerate uh, a frozen conflict like this if it were to erupt over Taiwan or, or somewhere else. So that's the shorter term kind of discussion of balancing and, and, and attention and how long Uh, But it is important that the initial, uh, in my assessment, the initial mindset in Washington was that by about this time, uh, in August, late summer, uh, we were expecting or predicting a a higher degree of Russian exhaustion that would make the Russian ability to sustain the invasion of Ukraine uh, untenable. And the, the question, and this then brings us back to, well, uh, what type of relationship does Russia have, particularly with China, if, if China essentially feels that quiet support of Russia uh, in Ukraine, sustaining the Russian position in Ukraine, uh, continues to distract the United States or, or focus the United States on Europe in a way uh, that is detrimental to uh, the longer term strategic position in Asia? And that, again, is a debate that we're, we're seeing uh, back and forth. Uh, 
But to this larger question uh, that you've, you've raised, uh, and I think what we are, are settling on and, and understanding is that um, linking the Euro-Atlantic Basin with the Indo-Pacific Basin, thinking about the Rimland, thinking about containing China as a potential uh, continental hegemon with or with a weakened Russia as its partner, uh, is therefore India becomes the, the geostrategic prize. Uh, I think what we're going to see uh, moving forward is the competition to, to woo India, because India becomes that linchpin. And if India becomes more closely connected through the quad with Japan and Australia and the United States from the Indo-Pacific side, what it's now doing in the Middle East, uh, with the uh, India to the Gulf to Israel, creating that corridor and obviously creating that as an alternative way to move goods and services uh, from the uh, economic dynamos the Pacific region, to Europe and to the West. Uh, if you see the beginnings of a closer strategic uh, partnership uh, between India and key European states, and then, of course, continuation of the strategic partnership with the United States, then that begins to address this question. On the other hand, uh, Russia and China uh, are trying to incentivize India, not necessarily to join them, but to remain kind of a neutral, uh, to, to play a bigger role, perhaps uh, uh, on a bigger scale than, say, what we've seen Turkey playing. Uh, where Turkey really is on sort of both uh, both sides of the fence. Uh, and that would be very useful, uh, uh, certainly to Russia, if India were to remain more uh, strategically autonomous. Uh, obviously, we've seen India uh, becoming much more important to Russia as, as part of Russia's survival strategy from Western sanctions uh, and uh, Western, uh, uh, the, the cessation of Western purchases of uh, Russian energy and uh, of Russian commodities. Uh, so I think India uh, returns to its sort of strategic importance uh, that it had, that certainly the British understood uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, that when you're thinking about these two principal basins of the world where most of the world's uh, economic activity takes place, uh, India sits at the, at the keystone between the two of them. And so how that relationship evolves, not just simply thinking of India as an Asian power, uh, but to the extent we think of India thinking and looking westward, not only towards the Middle East, but towards the Euro-Atlantic world, uh, I think that that is really what's going to determine how this security architecture, and as you put it also, the economic architecture uh, takes place uh, for the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Let's focus now on Russia and its relationship with the uh, European Peninsula. Russia, as you said, has to make a decision what it uh, wants to be. But isn't it so that uh, Russia had the time to make the decision and it decided that it wants to be almost a peer competitor or even a peer power great power between China, United States, with Europe being a playground of great power game in Eurasia. And this is why they demand, they made those demands to the United States for removing troops west of Poland and having a zone of influence. And because it was regarded as a bluff, the bluff was, was called, and this is what the war in Ukraine is all about. So with blood and treasure, you know, the iron cast were were uh, the iron dice using the Bismarckian phrase uh, were cast, and we will see what Russia is. And uh, this is just the beginning of my question, and of course I would very much welcome your comment, because uh, you know I'm I'm sitting in Poland as we speak now, and in Poland we sort of thought prior to the war that Russia is very well on a way to consolidate its interests with the European continent in terms of, uh, practically speaking, Germany and France after Brexit and with the United States in decline, remember Kabul withdrawal, all those uh, lukewarm negotiations of a START treaty, lack of resources, U US resources, lack of real forces in Europe. 
as it was perceived, and the uh, per perceived uh, localized dominance of the Russian ground forces in this part of the world. And of course, energy dependence, uh, food supply chains control. So Russians had a lot of leverages. And this is what Putin had in his head when he started this war. Wasn't it so that Russia made the decision of becoming a European power, but with a shareholding much bigger than the West was ready to give to them in the system. And uh, Russia really wanted not to be with China. They wanted to be with Europe, like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky would like to see, but on a completely new terms where Russia is a great power, maybe even a security guarantor, maybe even the power projection country for the European peninsula, buffer zone against China, projecting power southwards towards India even if, if need be, and blocking the Makindarian continental consolidation on uh, per, as wished by China even more than the, than the Europeans. Uh, so the space from Vladivostok to Lisbon, and you know what? The efforts of the Ukrainian army broke this thing. Not even the United States. Of course, not the German government that still seems in Warsaw to wait, wait out this ho horrible scenario of cutting off from the Russian energy supply and you know find some solution so that those guys still have the cheap energy. So the cons continental consolidation, including Europeans, was the ultimate goal of Russia, but on new terms, without the United States, and of course, with, with the completely demolition of any agency of the intermarium countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so do you agree with this assessment and, the, and that the war in Ukraine is at least temporarily, for the time being, destroying this dream of Putin and is pushing Russia into the hands of China? And that's, that also poses strategic questions of uh, greater scale to the United States, because the United States, as Wes Mitchell rightly pointed in, in his report to Office on that assessment last year, doesn't want to have a two-front war. So how would you solve this riddle? And please comment on what I just said. Well, that's, uh, and I think you've, you've started, it's not just simply the treaty proposals that were, were issued by the Russian government, but even going back to Medvedev proposals for European security in 2009 and 2010, it was clear uh, that uh, the Russian preference was to rewrite the European security order uh, to give Russia uh, not just simply a greater voice, uh, but to uh, uh, more control over what happened in, in European security events and by extension to European politics and, and economics, uh, that Russia did not want to enter into, uh, and we've seen this with the beginning, the, the Russia-NATO uh, efforts stymied on the fact that uh, Russia was not willing to uh, accept a role that would require it to, to make a, a series of uh, not concessions, uh, but uh, accommodations to the way things are done. Uh, that there is a rule set that exists in European security, in Euro-Atlantic security. Uh, and of course, we're seeing some of the other partners in Europe uh, also perhaps pushing back against some of these notions now as well, but that, that's a separate, so per, perhaps a separate discussion. But uh, the Russians were always looking for, and then by that, uh, how could they gain influence? and particularly using energy, economics, geoeconomic tools uh, to, to win support uh, towards their vision of a restructured Europe, uh, restructuring the post-Cold War settlement. Uh, it was always very clear that the, that the focal point of that strategy was if you could create some sort of effective partnership with Paris and Berlin uh, to counterweight and, and, and move around, uh, Central Europe, certainly, uh, getting the, the British out of the European Union was, uh, at least at the beginning, a strategic boon uh, to, to Moscow's efforts there. Uh, and then you could essentially, what we've always seen, and I think this was clear for, for 20 years, uh, that in the end, Russia always wanted Berlin and Paris to essentially tell other, and, and to some extent now Rome, tell other European capitals, this is the, the new way things are going to be done, and, and you will accommodate Russia in these areas, uh, and that's that. Uh, exactly. And, and, and certainly what is very interesting about the timing 
And this raises questions about the timing and the clock and the planning in the Kremlin. Is launching the invasion of Ukraine this year before Nord Stream 2 was operational, before some of the greater interdependence that Nord Stream 2 would have created, not just simply for gas, but for petrochemicals, and then ultimately for hydrogen, right? Yeah. Because you may recall that some of the discussion about Nord Stream was not just simply about gas, but then that, you know, creating the foundation so that as Europe, in theory, pivoted away from hydrocarbons over the next 20 to 30 years, the next stage was developing Russian hydrogen in the same areas of the north and then being able to say, well, now we have this pipeline infrastructure, we, it, it can be used for natural gas, now it can be converted to hydrogen, uh, or we can convert one of the Nord Stream lines to, to hydrogen when hydrogen comes online. Uh, and really, if, if in a way, if Russia had simply waited uh, another two years, uh, and why Russia didn't, is it because they bought their own worries about Ukraine, Ukraine would be too successful, who knows? But the interesting point is that they launched this invasion at a point before, if, if it occurred later, and these things had already been in place, it would have been much more difficult, I think, to... Uh, uh, you might not even have the invasion. You might have had a different type of uh, Franco-German mission to Moscow uh, to avert military conflict, which would have uh, been much more accommodating. But uh, the fact that Russia decided to do this now, uh, before all of this was finalized, uh, you know, suggests that the, something about their strategic calculus uh, shifted. Um, but as you said, this now puts the Russian strategic establishment in a very unpleasant position because in the end, I think Russia has always preferred negotiating with Berlin and Paris uh, to negotiating with Beijing uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but uh, the biggest one, of course, is uh, that China's style, and we've seen this throughout the Belt and Road area, we've seen this even in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, and other uh, countries that, uh, you know, China is not an altruistic investor uh, and that they are very, uh, they will take their pound of flesh. Uh, and now it will be potentially Russia's turn uh, for years, having kind of held the Chinese off uh, in a number of areas where Russia was unwilling to concede. Uh, you know, China may finally gain access to the Arctic uh, in a way that Russia uh, was not prepared to do so. And then, of course, this has, as you said, changes some of the geostrategic uh, considerations of, of Europe and the United States because of China, which is able to uh, dominate in this partnership with Russia, uh, gains access to raw materials and supply lines that are harder for the United States and in, in the case of uh, and Europe and, and Japan in the case of a conflict to interdict, but also just simply gives uh, that raw material treasury to a Chinese economy and military industrial base uh, that uh, changes uh, China's ability over time to, to project power. And again, at the expense of Russia's ability to be an independent player uh, in the international system. I mean, this is really, I think, the... What, what, what we might be writing about uh, uh, in, in coming years is by launching this invasion of Ukraine in this style, in this fashion, in this timetable, uh, the end result has been uh, maybe that uh, Russia uh, ceases to be, certainly to be um, a player in Europe. Uh, it is pulled into uh, a Chinese orbit, uh, which, uh, you know, does not ultimately in the direction, even for Putin himself, uh, authoritarian uh, modernizer though he may be, the model in the end was always Europe. Uh, and now the model will be uh, Beijing. And you know, we, we know how, uh, you know, what the impacts that will be on Russian state and society to be largely pulled into a Chinese dominated uh, system, um, you know, I think it will amplify these fracture points, but it'll also potentially amplify fracture points within Russian society itself. 
uh, Russian's conception, even if Russians conceived of themselves as Eurasian, as being sort of Europe, but somewhat separate or, or affiliated with Europe, uh, a profound reorientation of Russia away from 300 years of, of looking westward, of thinking of Europe as its place to be a power towards, you know, being uh, uh, the Western outpost uh, of a uh, Sinosphere rather than the Eastern uh, marchlands of Europe, uh, I think will have profound uh, consequences. I think that will change the history of the last 500 years of European Peninsula. So this is the uh, the major transformation of, of of the security architecture in northern Eurasia. If that would be the uh, outpost of the Chinese influence, uh, that would tell something as well. So, well, and it, you know, and in a way, it provides you know for for thirty years we have you know how many conferences have we all been at with people scratching their heads asking what is what is the future of the North Atlantic Alliance? What's the future of NATO? Um, NATO re, re this in essence, uh, and I think we see this in the strategic concept and understanding that uh, NATO uh, is returning as a strategic security alliance uh, and that part of this is to uh, ensure that the European peninsula and as much of those uh, European borderlands uh, are uh, you know, protected. And then again, if we begin to think about NATO and the strategic concept begins to think through the Mediterranean, through the Rimland, connecting with emerging security architecture uh, in, in Asia, uh, this doesn't necessarily create a global NATO, which I don't think is necessarily feasible, but a series of uh, strategic uh, partnerships and coalitions uh, which then can create the basis for a new balance of power. And I think that in some ways, uh, we have a revised version of Kennan. Uh, just as uh, George Kennan said, you, you contain the Soviet Union uh, until you allow for a certain process of transformation within uh, to occur, uh, that at a certain point, a China that is balanced and contained uh, has internal issues, uh, which as we've seen, communist systems can adapt, uh, but they're also brittle, uh, as the Soviet Union proved. Uh, and that, you know, this, again, kind of a containment for the 21st century of avoiding war, making sure that conditions for war are never uh, feasible, uh, but at the same time, uh, preventing uh, from kind of using external export of problems in order to sustain or, or maintain uh, control of the system at home. And perhaps this will lay the basis, not China joining the World Trade Organization, which I think was the hope in, at, at the beginning of the millennium uh, to, to transform China, but a China that cannot, uh, in essence, uh, push outward to solve its domestic internal problems, uh, then that creates the basis for uh, internal internal shifts. So that may be, as you said, not only rewriting the history of Europe for 500 years, but maybe that we also have to go back and rethink some of the lessons of uh, the 20th century for the 21st. Let, let, let's focus for, for a while on China. You mentioned Canon and the containment strategy of the United States, but don't you think that the containment strategy against China is undoable in contemporary world for the following reasons. First of all, Cannon's grand strategy, strategy for the United States was proposed uh, on, uh, you know, at, the, uh, at the end of the Second World War, when there were red lines, where the Soviet troops were, this was the Russian, Soviet sphere of influence, when the American, uh, and so on and so forth. So there was no gray zone, or at least no unknown zone, who belongs to whom. There was no globalized trade trading system. So there was no tension. It's like with marriages. Once you divorce, it's the most, you know, tension provoking. When you are separate, it's not. And here the story is that in order to contain China, first you would have to decouple, because China is everywhere, 
everywhere in our homes, in our houses, in our families, because they, they are the greatest manufacturer of, of common goods from the entire you know, civil, human civilization. So how can you contain such a country that has so many connectivities with so many countries, either raw supplies from Middle East and Australia or backwards and so forth and so forth? That's a good example of Germany. They didn't want to ban the wagon with the United States strategy against, against China. They don't want to ally with the United States on that. Even the allies in Asia being threatened by China are afraid that they might be on losing end because at the end of the day, China has always been in history, with an exception of the last 150 years, the largest economy of the world. So we are betting on a winner. Okay? So how, how do we want to adopt Canon? And, and, and I think this is the most important question in our conversation, especially long-term for the entire 21st century, because if the United States adopts a wrong strategy, yes, we're going to have a war, systemic war over dominance on planet Earth. So what, what should be the best strategy of the United States to deal with, uh, with the rising China? Well, as you said, China is everywhere. But I think what we've seen from the pandemic onward is the realization that China be everywhere with no alternative is not necessarily a long-term sustainable approach. That complete decoupling is going to be difficult and will not happen. So we'll, we'll, we'll set that aside. But alternatives and encouraging those alternatives becomes... Uh, quite critical, both so that uh, there are alternatives in place, but also to uh, reduce some of that uh, over-dependence uh, on China. So largely, this is not going to be a military strategy. This is going to be an economic one. Uh, the question then becomes, is there going to be sufficient will and interest and a willingness not just simply of governments, but let's bring it down to the average person. Let's bring it to the doorstep level, to consumers in countries willing to pay uh, a price, increased price, in order to uh, decouple or partially decouple from China. So the question then becomes of uh, a number of these initiatives that have started over the last number of years, resilient supply chain, the golden supply chain uh, initiatives in the Asia Pacific, which is to uh, ensure that uh, we have alternatives to a supply chain that always runs through China. Do we support and encourage India's efforts to become uh, an alternative supplier of semiconductors so that we're no longer caught in the Taiwan-China trap uh, of semiconductors, uh, that we have alternative sources? Uh, do we move ahead? A very interesting uh, set of proposals coming out of the uh, uh, Atlantic Council, uh, Ash Jane, Matthew Kronig, uh, and uh, Marlene Petzinger from uh, collaborating with them from uh, IISS about uh, do we begin to consciously, in a policy sense, reorient our trade and supply chains towards a greater, uh, what they call a democratic trade and economic partnership, uh, where we uh, take our supply chains, we take our raw material bases, uh, and we ensure that we have created alternatives uh, so that uh, not all trade runs through China. Because as you've noted, uh, the Chinese strategy is to make China the indispensable country economically. Yeah. And so the question is, is, is that when, you know, China will always be a major economy and major trading partner. But for the last, again, for the last 20 years, we operated from a very uh, benign business sense that uh, interdependence uh, meant that you could not have security challenges, you could not have conflict. Uh, this was the Dell theory of conflict pre uh, prevention that Michael Dell coined, that if uh, you have an integrated supply chain and China is part of that supply chain, that China will never threaten the use of force because it's part of an integrated supply chain and we're all making, making money from it. Um, what the Japanese government has been doing over the last several years is a, a beginning of a benchmark of uh, conscious, and again, this for the United States creates some issues where we traditionally don't like uh, or we're allergic to government 
uh, playing a, a role in economy, but uh, the, what the Japanese have been doing, first starting under the late Prime Minister Abe and continuing, which is to give support for diversifying these supply chains. Uh, precisely for that point that you raised, that yes, allies in the Asia Pacific, uh, even those threatened by China may not be willing to engage in collective action for fear of interrupting their, uh, their economic links or because they need vital uh, raw materials or they need commodities or they need uh, particular component parts uh, that, that China produces. Uh, so a 21st century cannon is not primarily a, as you said, a military where the troops are. And we had uh, a sense of the red lines and the blue lines, and, 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 and we could draw that on the map. But it is thinking in these uh, geoeconomic terms and thinking very consciously about where we're choosing to supply from. And again, where it comes back to consumers, and this is where it may, may falter. Let me be very, very blunt and say where this could fail. Uh, this could fail because consumers in various countries may say, I want the cheapest option. Uh, Europe, Germany is going, will go through this test. Everyone in Europe will go through this test uh, with energy uh, of saying, well, uh, I don't care what Russia has done in Ukraine. I want lower energy bills. And if that means sacrificing European uh, security on the eastern frontier, uh, so be it. And again, in democratic countries, uh, we, we face the possibility that voters may not uh, may not be convinced. But I think that if we begin to build these networks, uh, these economic networks, as you build these economic networks, you build the security networks to safeguard them. And then a balance does begin to emerge. It doesn't have to be confrontational. Uh, it, it can't, but it will emerge because you will have these alternatives. China will also then have to assess whether or not what it has done, and we saw this during the pandemic, the pandemic revealed uh, the ability and willingness of China to weaponize uh, and use their economic linkages as pressure. You want vaccines, you want protective equipment, you want pharmaceuticals, it wasn't just simply a business relationship anymore of pay us money on the barrel and we'll deliver. It was, no, 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 not just simply you'll pay us for these things, but here's a, here's a list of political demands we have. Uh, that should be a wake-up call, uh, that this idea that trade happens no matter what, business is business, that is not necessarily the view held in China, uh, certainly not by the Chinese government. And it, therefore, we do have a the beginnings of this strategy uh, beginning to emerge uh, for a partnership among democracies uh, to reorient their trade. And then, frankly, also, as the Russian invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated, uh, that partnership becomes also vital in the question of energy, not only with filling the short-term uh, issue of, of hydrocarbons, but about having to move to new technologies uh, in the long run. Um, my worry here is that a lot of great proposals, so we have the DTEP proposal, uh, we have the, the European US, Euro, Union US uh, trade and technology dialogue, we have the Quad in Asia talking not just simply about uh, security, but talking about resilient supply chains, uh, but it will take uh, committed governments uh, that will sign on to these strategies, it will take investments, and it's going to take staying power. Uh, if not, then the risks that we, we run two sets of risks. One is uh, we simply sort of revert back to what we had, not quite prior to 2020, but uh, of, well, we just learned to live with Russia and China and, and some of these economic dependencies return. And we kind of muddle through that way. Or the other worry that you have said, which is the economics don't come together. Uh, and so we have the instrumentality of the sword. And then all of a sudden we begin thinking about these, uh, this containment in military terms, uh, which could potentially lead to, as you said, a systemic war, uh, which uh, because we're dealing with nuclear armed powers, uh, raises not just simply a destructive conventional conflict, but uh, once again, 
puts us under the, the sort of Damocles that we thought we'd escaped from uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed in, in 1991. So I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have the last question about Europe, but excellence. So what's going to happen to Europe then? What's going to happen to EU? Will it disintegrate over the issue as to the uh, assessment of threat? And I think this is the most primable uh, factor in trying to consolidate any political unity. Yes. And it seems to us here in Central Eastern Europe that there is no common threat perception across the uh, EU. Uh, whether it will be pressed hard by energy crisis and this social contract breakdown, if the energy crisis uh, gets more profound. And food supply as well, crises and pressure from the Middle East and Levant and nor Northern Africa. So, is Europe going to be a playground of great powers without military, without the uh, industry of the future, with uh, shrinking demography? What do you think? Well, how would you yeah. forecast the future of, of uh, Europe? Well, Europe, is, uh, Europe has choices to make, uh, and it has choices to make uh, in, the, in the coming months and years, which will determine uh, you know, what arrangements exist on the continent. And then, as you said, not just simply on the continent, but how it connects to uh, the regions around it, uh, particularly across the Mediterranean to Africa, uh, across the Atlantic to the United States, into the Middle East, and of course, into not just simply Russia, but the rest uh, uh, of, of Eastern Europe and, and Eurasia um, that, uh, you know, the, the, from the Caspian and the Black Sea. Uh, I think that the first thing is um, that uh, this uh, uh, realization uh, that somehow we had entered into a post-conflict world in Europe uh, where uh, hard decisions about military things were, would be taken by others outside of the continent um, has to end. I think we're already beginning to see that. We were seeing that uh, beginning in fits and starts after 2014. Um, but the realization of uh, that Europe has to be able to, to defend itself, uh, it has to be able to do more for its own security. Uh, this also means, as you said, a revisitation of solidarity. Um, it, it's, it's amazing as an American to watch uh, Europeans talk about Europe uh, as an entity, and then when uh, decisions or hard choices are made, everyone fragments back to their. Uh, you know, sovereign national unit. Um, you know, this is the conversation of what it means for European solidarity between Poland to Portugal, uh, you know, Norway to Greece, is uh, what extent your problems are my problems. Uh, if someone in Portugal says, well, I'm not worried about Russians uh, coming anywhere here other than as tourists, uh, maybe you know Russian money coming in uh, in a in a corrupt fashion, but I'm not worried about Russian troops. Um, well, maybe you should because that is someone in Norway says I'm not worried as much about the migration question. Um, well, then perhaps that's of concern. I think rebuilding, I, I think it's easy to have solidarity when times are good, times are bad, and the question of solidarity is, is more critical. That may sound very glib coming from an American sitting across the uh, water who is not dealing with, uh, you know, the, the real crisis that this creates. Um, but that building that sense and, and honing that sense of solidarity in a time of crisis is, is going to be critical and, and drawing on that. Uh, talking about demography, um, you know, Europe, I think, has to start making some decisions about, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a European Union, about um, human capital. Uh, where do you want human successor capital to come from? Um, how much is internally generated by fertility? Uh, how much should be encouraged by immigration? Um, you know, this goes, brings us back to the question of Ukraine. Uh, in a sense that, uh, and other former uh, republics of the Soviet Union, 
um, in terms of, you know, is, is, does Europe see that? Uh, obviously, that's a real problem for Ukraine if Ukraine were to depopulate uh, and continue to depopulate. But does Europe want uh, migrants coming in, uh, immigrants coming in from cultures that are similar? Uh, this also raises the question of Latin America uh, uh, and, you know, Western uh, uh, countries, uh, Western cultures. Uh, do you want uh, immigrants uh, that can be assimilated culturally, even if uh, physically they may look different? Uh, don't necessarily. Uh, and these, again, these are longer term societal questions. But I think that this links into this question of where ultimately I think that, and the choice is being made, perhaps uh, grudgingly. But yes, we need to be thinking Europe as a key component, as a united Europe. Uh, as part of this extended Atlantic community, uh, when we start thinking about the Atlantic community, not just as the United States, but we're thinking about Latin America, we're thinking about uh, uh, Western Africa as part of that community, not just simply for resources and trade, but uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, a, a region of the world that has some commonalities uh, and that you can build on those uh, for uh, connecting, uh, you know, Europe used to be connected. Uh, uh, one just simply has to travel in Latin America to uh, uh, to understand the the cultural connections uh, between uh, uh, Europe and and uh, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but in encouraging that sense of of community, and there's been some move, perhaps, with the EU in Latin America. But I think that you begin to think of the Atlantic community really in Europe having to play a bigger role in its defense, a bigger role as part of, as the industrial powerhouse, as one of the technological powerhouses of an expanded Atlantic community. And when you think of an expanded Atlantic community uh, uh, around the Atlantic basin, that really becomes uh, a key part of any kind of global balance uh, moving into the 21st century. Uh, and then thinking about how far that Atlantic community extends uh, and this, again, where the question of, I think, and, and you, we, we started our conversation with this, uh, Ukraine, and not, again, not to be trite about the, you know, the root meaning of, of, of the term Ukraine, but, uh, you know, it is Ukraine, it is at the border. Uh, and really, I think this sense of where Europe really begins to say, this is where we're going to kind of draw uh, our if necessary, fortifications, but also the idea of safeguarding this as an economic community, as a technological community, an energy community, a health community, uh, of thinking of the Atlantic Basin and the Atlantic Alliance in those terms. Um, it does require leaders. It requires parties prepared to uh, make the arguments to populations why Uh, I hope that we'll see a new generation of, of leaders in Europe and the United States, uh, the, an Atlantic community of 21st century. Uh, so I remain hopeful in that regard. And I think that that's also really one of the best ways to ensure that we don't end up with the war uh, as an alternative hanging over our heads uh, as we move into the midpoint of this century. Let this, uh, let this be a summary, or at least the final point of our conversation that has started in the earnest towards the, the, the end of, uh, of our recording. So that's maybe a hope for uh, convincing you for another one shortly. Thank you very sure. much. Thank you. Uh, Nicolas Gwozdev was our guest at Strategy in Future. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, and please you stay you. stay with us for more episodes to come. Thank you very much. Jacek Bartosiak.